Our next company is GovX Uranium. Uh, GovX Uranium Inc. is focused on the exploration and development of uranium properties in Africa. It is listed on the TSXV and OTC exchanges with the ticker GXU and has a market cap of £53 million. GovX already has three major projects, or it's two actually, Mine Permitted Maduela project in Niger, which is the flagship development, the Mine Permitted Muntanga project in Zambia, and it has just, it's in the process of selling a multi-element project in Mali called Falia. The company already has a sizable resource inventory with £130 million of U308 in the measured and indicated ca categories and its objective is to become a significant uranium producer. We're joined live tonight by Daniel Major, CEO at GovX Uranium Inc. Welcome Daniel. Thank you very much, Charles. Appreciate the intro. Hello Daniel, how are you? I'm very good, very good. Looking now, I, 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 I think you're a busy man. <laughs> I am a very busy man. Very busy, man. I, 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 Guviex Uranium have been up to a lot. I had a quick scan through your R&S's uh, 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 before this presentation. And uh, there's no shortage of things to talk to you about, that's for sure. No, there isn't. And uh, we're having you know, certainly two big development projects um, under our wing to move through um, and working on debt, working on feasibility studies on those. And both are mine permitted. And more importantly, with the uranium market that's as most analysts would say, it has never been so good. Um, there is plenty for us to keep entertained and uh, keep our minds sharp. Okay, Daniel, uh, if you uh, give us your presentation and uh, come back to us in 20 minutes, we'd be delighted to, to ask you some more questions. Yeah, no problem at all, no problem at all. So, yep, GovX Uranium, we are an African-focused uranium development company. Uh, just for an aside, that picture you see on the first slide is actually our Niger project, uh, situated right in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Um, sorry, I'm a bit of a problem getting my slides to move. There we go. Uh, disclaimers, uh, they're all on our website. Make, make some forward-looking statements, so obviously got to show all of these, uh, but they're there for, for reference. So, yeah, we are a very much a development-focused company. We have the two main projects. That's the Madawela project in Niger and the Muntanga project in Zambia. Both of those are fully mine permitted. Uh, we're, we're committed to getting both of them up into production. We still have on our books technically the Falea project in um, Mali, uh, but that is part of a sale process that's ongoing. We are seeing a much stronger uranium sector, particularly driven by an increasing focus on nuclear energy around the world, uh, as people appreciate that the only real way to meet net zero is to bring nuclear into that story. Um, we have a clear timing advantage. Um, we are already permitted. We haven't got to go through those long permitting processes. Um, Africa brings very clear development. They are G GDP commodity driven communities. Uh, they want mines. They've got governments that are very much focused on getting mine development going forward. We also have a very large mineral resource already in the ground, but a lot of potential to add to that through further exploration. So Africa is our, is our target. I've been working in and out of Africa for my career. I've been a mining engineer for over 35 years. Niger um, is currently the fifth, sixth largest producer of uranium. Um, been producing uranium since the early 1970s. In fact, last year, 25% of all the uranium consumed in Europe came out of Niger. So it's a guaranteed shipping route sitting there. Zambia, obviously more known for being an Af um, a copper mining country, but is looking to diversify its mining industry. And even copper, it's trying to triple its copper production under the new government. So focus on logistics, training, power, these things, all that help anyone who's in any form of mining. Uh, and then we have Mali, which is a, a gold playing country. Uh, on the market, I think really the, the key highlight here is just that in the last 24 months, the radical change that we have seen in perception towards the nuclear industry. Um, we in COP26, it was the first time that the World Nuclear Association attended and was allowed to attend a COP event. Most of the governments around the world have substantive changes and growth strategies um, in Europe. We have countries now like um, Belgium, Holland, uh, which were not currently nuclear and want to go nuclear. Um, Finland, Sweden have all want to expand. Even here in the UK, we have a massive expansion on nuclear energy. 
The US government has got a, over $7 billion focused towards nuclear energy development. Japan is got, where we had Fukushima is going back to over 20% of its generation. But more importantly, it's not just government that's changing. We're seeing substantial changes in the voters' view on where nuclear is. So even in Scotland, which is anti-nuclear at the moment from a government point of view, the majority of the population actually want to be nuclear. And the same actually applies in Germany. The other thing that's changing as well is the move to the small modular reactors. We've been looking at these big reactors in the past, um, but the smaller reactors are getting fast track to development, probably expecting to see the first of them from the 2030 onwards. Um, but we play this massive growth. So we're looking at the moment about 6% uh, cargo for the upper end growth for the World Nuclear Association. But at the same time, we haven't had new mines come into production. So as you see from the chart below, we have a complete collapse coming forward on supply from nuclear, even if you add all the existing plan product and plan production coming through. We have a market at the moment which consumes about 190 million pounds. This year will produce about 128 million pounds. We're at a big supply deficit that has been made up by inventory movement, but we're running out of inventory there. The other factors, geopolitics, obviously Russia's invasion of the Ukraine has had a major effect on the uranium industry, mainly because they're a major supplier of the enriched products. 20% of all the uranium consumed in the US comes out of Russia from enriched products. They account for 34% of the global enrichment side. So we're so seeing a lot of self-sanctioning. We're seeing move now to actual sanctioning of Russian material coming out. We've seen a couple of states do it already in the US. That's important because it's pushing the suppliers to find alternative routes. Africa, therefore, becomes very much part of this diversity of supply, political pr pr protection. Um, on uranium production going forward, which really plays beautifully into our project. So if we start with the Niger one, uh, we're in northern Niger, up in the middle of the Sahara Desert. We are right next to two old uranium mines, Komenak and Somaya, which started in the 70s. Komenak closed actually in 2021. It's a really good infrastructure, road, power, skilled people, um, and more importantly, water, uh, even though we're in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Um, we're fully permitted up. We've got great government support. They are 20% shareholders with a 10% free carry uh, and moving towards production on that one. We put out an FS uh, at the end of last year, very much a self-sustaining operation, uh, bringing in uh, solar energy on that as well. We're in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Surprisingly, only get about 26% of our energy, despite the fact we're in the middle of the Sahara Desert done a lot of work of making sure this is up to international standards, continuous rehab on our tailings dam, those kind of things. We halved our water consumption through change in technology uh, going forward. So we're looking at a, at a $65, uh, an 8% MPV rate, $140 million, IRR 13%. The one thing I'd point out here, this is one of the few projects that goes past about 10 years in mine life. So this, this is a 20 year mine life project almost with a lot of exploration potential, even known resources could be added to this resource. We get no benefit for the last 10 years of our project, but it produces consistently $83 million of EBITDA across the whole thing. It's well positioned on the cost curve as well. What we're doing at the moment is working on the debt financing. We appointed Endeavor Financial out of London. They specialize in mining projects and particularly into Africa. Um, they did also into South America, they did um, Lundin Gold's um, project uh, in Ecuador. They've done a whole bunch of others in Africa. Now, what we did is a, a teaser. We got 20 different companies and different and, and vehicles looking at lending. Came through at the end of last year. We're honing that down after them going through the due diligence. We have a number of export credit agencies, uh, commercial banks still in the pool who provided us letters of interest waiting for a couple of DFIs to give us their answer. So hopefully the next big trigger for this project is coming out to say, look, we've got the letters of interest for the debt pool. We can now move that forward into the financing stage. Alongside that, doing the work on the offtake contracts, and I'm sure you'll have some questions on that. Um, and we'll, we'll deal with that through this year. Target to get all of that done by the end of this year, go into construction and then be producing uranium 2026. Um, Matawala. Takes us then into Matanga, which is our second one, again, fully mine permitted. This is in southern Zambia. 
really good infrastructure. It's about three, four hour drive down a tarmac road from Lusaka. Uh, good road access through into Zimbabwe down in South Africa. Uh, we did a PEA back in 2017 when we merged two projects together, which had already been at PFS. But one of the companies had added a resource, which is currently about 50% of our total resource called Dibwe East. Uh, we've now moved that program into a full feasibility study. Uh, that's ongoing at the moment. This project is very low capex. So Maduela is slightly higher capex. This is low capex. Maduela is low opex. This is higher, slightly higher opex the way the two balance out. It benefits from a very low strip ratio, but more importantly, a very low acid consumption. Acid is the single largest consumable in the uranium industry across the, the, the dial. Um, to put it into context, our peers in Niger consume about 100 kg a ton of acid for every ton of rock. Uh, we have it down to 50 in Niger. This is under 10. Uh, and in a country that produces sulfuric acid. So very positive. Target for this is kind of this time next year, feasibility study complete, move into the next stage on the project. Uh, the Phileo one, I'll just really just touch. This is a really interesting project. We really decided to sell it because we had to focus ourselves. We had these two really big projects going into development. This one was taking time off and we couldn't give it the dedication it deserves. So hence the reason for the sale decision. Uh, ESG, I got to touch on this because it's really important. Uh, not only as a mining industry a, a company, it's also important to our off-takers. Um, a lot of the off-takers will come and do an ESG review of you. Uh, we do a lot of work in our design to make sure we take this into account right from the very beginning. Um, and we have already put our first sustainability report out last year. Um, and it is very much part of the way we design our mines so the second one will be out, the ESG report will be out about September this year. Um, current insiders hold about 12%. Um, we cleared out a bunch of debt at the end of last year. The remaining shares are about 50-50 um, on retail versus um, investment institutional holdings. Um, and then really from a value perspective here, guys, when we, we are massively cheap. Um, this is all about taking an, an, an exploration company, development company, and turning it into a producer. We've seen that uplift in the past. If you looked in the 2007 cycle, Paladin went from seven cents to $7. It was one of the few companies that actually built a mine in that cycle. Um, Africa's interesting. Chinese competitors can't buy uranium very easily from Canada and Australia. They have to come to Africa or they'll get it from the Kazakh. So in the last cycle in 2011, most of the takeouts from an M&A point of view were all African companies being purchased out because the people need to control 100% of their project. So different ways to look at that. For us as a company, it's all about getting to the development stage. If somebody turns up with an egregiously ch large check, we will definitely consider that as an option to take us forward. So just finish off, really strong market. I mean, it is as good as we've ever seen it. We are very much a development focused company. You know, I see the real value turn here is on that debt announcement when we finally get a, the, the, the final decisions from the DFIs. A lot of exploration upside, permitted projects, perfect time to be in the industry. Daniel, that sounds as though you've done that presentation a few times. I think you uh, took a sound guys by surprise. We were expecting you to finish in a few minutes' time. I know. <laughs> it's, get it out of the way. The Q&A is uh, way more fun. The Q&A is way a lot more fun. So you've turned into a different person, Daniel. <laughs> How interesting. You've, you've become a human being and you were before you were a presenting machine. So here we go. Let's, let's focus on your flagship uh, yeah. project in Maduela in Niger. Uh, what makes that the flagship project? That's a good starting question, it, isn't it? it? It's sheer scale. Uh, I mean, the one thing uh, I made the point, we, we have a series of exploration licenses. We just focused on the one, but we can expand. We're, we're basically the, the, the stru same structure as the existing mines. You've got a long life project. As I said, it's over 20 years. So once this thing gets up and going, we can continue to expand off it. You're in a, in a uranium jurisdiction. I mean, that is also really important that these, the company of Niger understands uranium mining. It has no issue with it. It's been doing it for a long time. You know, a few years ago, uranium exports out of Niger were 60% of the country's exports by value. So this is a big component of it. It's very robust. It's one that we designed on the basis, get it going at two and a half million pounds. We can scale it up later but get the cash flows coming out of it because that will then support development on our other project. 
as you, you mentioned, it was low capex. So that's part. That's all part of the strategy. You've thought this through. Yeah, well, that one's a slightly higher capex on the first one, but it's got the lower opex. So get the cash generation going is is all what it's about, um, and then get the Zambian one. And the Zambian one naturally was slightly behind. Um, it, there's some politics here as well because, of course, in Niger we have a, a shareholder, which is the government. So you want to keep them on side at the same time. What's it like having a the, the government as a major shareholder? Well, they're, they're is that, the is that both a good thing and a bad thing. They're minority shareholders. They're, they're actually very. It's very good. I mean. You look, you're you're all on the same page. As I say, the governments in 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 Africa tend to be countries that are GDP commodity driven. They want mining. You know, it's a big part of their economy, and so therefore they want to drive mining. So it's not like if you're in North America, where mining is such a small part of the economy that you know there are many other aspects. It doesn't get a fair crack at the whip. Whereas in Africa, you know, mining makes a difference uh, in, in many aspects, including the ESG side of it. So if you've got a government that's also a shareholder with you, you're aligned. You, you want the same thing. They want the tax revenues. They want the, the, the growth. You want the, the profits. You want to build a mine. So everybody's looking for the same end result at the end of the day, which is, is really positive. OK, that's a very good answer. Uh, you already have a mine permit, permit. In fact, for both your projects. Uh, which can be quite tricky to get hold of. So that's a, yep. a big plus. Um, what remains to be done to get the, uh, the Maduella project um, into production? Give us a, give us a, a sense of yep. what's to come and the, and the timelines. Yeah, so as I said in the present day, the real focus at the moment is on the debt. Uh, get the debt lined up. So we're looking at about a $350 million capital for this project, rounding it out. Uh, we're looking about $190 million worth of debt as the target for it. Um, the rest would become equity. So the first stage is get that debt package lined up. You know, this is an unconventional commodity. There has not been a lot of uranium projects being financed by debt for a while. There's one next door to us that's currently going through that program as well. So that's the that's the key. We, we've got that initial pool together. I, I am like this close on having the full debt package cover. I just need one other group to come in. Uh, and we're getting a lot of export credit DFI support as well, which just shows international government support for a development side is really supportive here. So we're that close. At the you same said you're time, lots of, of interest, and it's about getting those to the next level. Yeah, well, effectively, it's getting, and it's also getting that getting that total pool big enough that when we get to you, you also can expect some creep on those packages. I want it to be so big that even if I've got shrinkage, I I, I, I know I'm safe to get to the very end because once you commit in this whole process, you know, you want to keep moving. You do not want to be stopping in this process. Um, you know, that that inefficient costs you money. You want to get moving and get the whole process going. So what we've also got doing, do, have been doing is a lot of conversations with the off takers um, around the world. They're a key. So that debt is going to need the off take to underpin it. Um, you're going to have to have hedging into this kind of structure. Uh, going forward. So the off take is a, a key part of that program. We've been talking to them for the last 18 months, explaining our process. We've kept them very much in touch. Uh, I was at the WNFC in The Hague, one of the big world nuclear association conferences, met with 30 different utilities. They're all keen. We, we sign up regularly for RFPs. We get, you know, the feedback to us is, guys, you're like this close to winning RFPs now, where the market has moved to what you guys are looking for. So that momentum's building. Once we got those two pieces together, they off taken the debt, it goes down to the equity piece. But that only comes at the very end. It's the big Rubik's Cube. We just, at the end, it all kind of go, oh, I made it. Um, and then, because then the easy bit, we have to build it. So I'm hoping that we can pull all of that together by, you know, hopefully the end of this year, but probably into the first quarter of next year. Uh, and then it's a two year build from that point onwards. Are the the off take uh, the off takers are they quite competitive with one another at the moment? Suddenly, uh, no, it's, uh, suddenly no, it's not their market. No, they tend to be fairly independent of each other. Uh, it's a fairly secretive business. This uranium selling stuff, um, you know, they they tend to come and talk directly. It's a direct contract discussion uh, with you. They'll put out RFPs. You you bid in on those RFPs. They come back. You negotiate your contract that you're going to have. Um, so, no, they're not actively competing with each other. Uh, but what you are starting to see is there are companies that we were dealing with a year ago that would only buy in the spot market, particularly US guys, only bought the spot market, didn't care. 
Now they only do the RFP market. Complete turnaround where people are starting to worry about where their material is coming from. Um, that, we've, that was my point. That's exactly my point. And, and that momentum's kicking in. If you look at the volumes that are trading at the moment, they're really low, which is surprising. Spot markets got very quiet as people are trying to figure out. And, and what you're seeing, we were talking to one utility, which initially was looking for material around the 2026 level in the U, U308 market. We went to this, well, how are you doing? And, no, we don't need any U308 for 2026 anymore. I was like, okay, fine. That was strange. And go, no. We pin, uh, we went and got a U3, a, an EUP contract instead. So I don't know if you know the difference, but I'll just briefly explain. So we produce U308. About 0.7% of U308 is of any use. The 99.3% is complete garbage and can be thrown away. So what you do is you, you convert that first into US6. Uh, that can only be done in five different sites around the world. That's then enriched in basically a blood centrifuge to separate the the different U3, U238 and 235 to, to get you to about 4 to 5% of U235. That's your EUP. So what these guys were doing was saying, well, we'll get an EUP contract instead with one of the enrichers. But now what happens is that the enrichers who've got that contract are now back in the market looking for the U308. So that, that momentum is building here. And particularly as people try to pull away from Russia. Um, and we're now starting to see a lot more aggression out there. Um, come, somebody like Cameco came out the other day and said they're putting out hedge contracts that are floors at 55, ceilings at 75, and they're base escalated. So, you know, yeah, and they're base escalated going out as well. So you can see that price move is always pushing up at the moment. Um, okay. So good really, really, really good for us. How long will it take you to get into production? Well, as I say, once we get the debt, it's two years of construction. It's fairly straightforward. There's no major long lead items on this project uh, at great. all. I made sure of that in the design work. Great, great, great. Um, one part of the jigsaw puzzle, the debt and equity jigsaw puzzle, you've just talked us through with, uh, beautifully, by the way. Uh, you've just raised 15 Canadian million Canadian dollars, or almost, I've translated that to 9 million pounds in a private placement. So what was the intention behind that capital raise? I think I know the answer. That's for Matanga. <laughs> Mainly for Matanga um, ah. and to get that feasibility study moving forward. Um, we In Matanga, about two years ago, we had about a half of our mineral resource was inferred in one deposit. Uh, we did a, a, a drilled a third of it just to test the sizing on the hole spacing to get it to indicate it. Last year, we finished all of the drilling on that one. Uh, I'm waiting for the final um, mineral reserve estimate to come out. Um, that's due very soon. But now what I've done is kicked off the full feasibility study. So we're using the Copper Belt University in Zambia uh, to do our updated metallurgical test work. This is a combination of two PFSs. We didn't do the PFSs. So we're redoing some of this work to really make sure that the numbers are valid. Um, and then we'll go into full feasibility study stage development as well so it's a really simple project it is five open pits four heat leaches feeding into a, a centralized plant very easy uh, but we just got to go through the work to get it done so target so more, by it, about this time next year that job will be finished as well so it's more infill drilling and it's lots of engineering works and so on and you've employed lots of different uh, uh, consultants yeah. i understand yeah, yeah. and the, inf the extra infill drilling is actually as a result of the drilling that we did we suddenly found that we still had extensions on the outside that we hadn't closed out the ore body so if you're going to design the open pit you better make sure you've closed out the ore body rather than leave something in uh, on the edges so some inf sort of filling around the edges but the key target really is get the detailed engineering work done uh, on that project okay and yep we've dealt with funding so moving moving swiftly on uh yeah is there more uranium resource to come at both these projects do you think you've got a 20 uh, 20 year uh, mine life in uh, in niger but more yeah. to come oh absolutely uh, absolutely i mean we stopped drilling in Madawela in 2013 we stopped drilling in Matanga previously in 2013 before we did the infill work. Between, Mata between the, the, the three deposits on the east west side of Matanga and the other two on the east side, there's a big gap we've never drilled. Uh, we have another license to the south of us called Kariba Valley, which is about 60 kilometers in length. 
uh, with holes pattered across it with uranium in, which we haven't had a chance to go out and drill yet. So a lot of potential there. Uh, if you look at Madawella, even within the known resource, we have resources around the open pit that we did not include. We left them in inferred, which, you know, is not part of the design. But as we get into production, we could actually access those underground resources directly from the bottom of the open pit. Um, we have a number of other exploration licenses around there still to drill towards. We're the up dip section of the Comanac mine. So we can actually drill towards Comanac as well. We can see where that old body goes. Um, so there's a lot more, but we kind of went, you got 20 years at two and a half million pounds per annum. There's no point in drilling yet. Wait until later. And then once you've got the cash flow going, it becomes brownfield exploration. You're feeding a mill from that point onwards. Okay, I was I was wondering about the, the processing uh, possibilities in Africa. So you've got Niger and you've also got Zambia. But Niger, it turns out, is actually a great place for processing uh, your ore. Tell us all. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's it's a, a very surprise to me the answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a straightforward process. Um, so it's sulfuric acid dilution. So um, you we quite simply import sulfur, convert that into sulfuric acid on site use that to dissolve the uranium, and then we just precipitate the U-308 out into, and dry it, calcinate it, put it into steel drums and ship it out the country. That's the simple version of it. It's a little more complex than that, but it, that's the simple version of it. But and what is quite nice- How do you ship it out of the country? Yeah, it just goes in, it goes in a container. That's, it's uh, uh, where? How does it, does it go to the coast? Yeah, we just truck it to, co it'll get trucked to Cotonou, which is the array away, rather than a, a Riva Arana, they keep changing their name. Um, have been doing it since the 1970s. So literally, convoys of containers are trucked down to the port in Cotonou. They've got a big storage area there. They sit there and wait for the next container ship that's coming past that will ship Class 7 material, and off it goes. It will go to basically Comorex, which is in France. Uh, it'll either go there to Convidine, which is in the US, or it'll go to Cameco in Canada. Those will be the three main areas. Or it'll go to China. Um, so those will be the four target areas that we'll ship to. Great. OK, my final question for you. Uh, I understand you're very strong on ESG. So here's an ESG question from Dave Danu. Uh, GovX operates in Niger, uh, which has a low GDP. How does it work ethically with the local community? Well, we, we have done a whole plethora of things regarding ESG. In 2009, the first thing we did is we went a 100% local employment strategy. Um, so I only employ local people in all of the country. So it's a key part of any ESG is local employment and not just local, it's local, local. So it's the people surrounding the project um, that get employed. And on that particular item, we put a press release out this week in the Zambia one when we were going through our consensus review. We discovered about 70 percent of our local population, which will have to move as a result of the project, have no education. So, you know, and they actually don't speak English. They use Tonga as their primary language. So we have set up a adult education program that will carry on now during all of our ex development stages for construction. So that by the time we're ready to employ, these people will have the skill sets that we need to be able to employ them directly on the mine, which means the people that we will move will be able to come straight from where we're re relocating and work and benefit from the mine. Uh, we do a lot of work on supplying water. Uh, we've done water in Niger, water in Zambia. Um, we've run reef farming programs uh, with a company called Rescope. We currently do a thing called Solar Mamas out of Niger, where we're take, training a, a number of ladies to install solar uh, and get it uh, and get entrepreneurial skills that go with it. Uh, at the same time, in Zambia, we've built schools, we've built clinics. Um, all of these things, it, you're working with our communities directly to say, well, what, what adds to your value uh, and how can we gain? But at the same time, it comes back to how we build our projects. The first thing we actually do on any project design is to look at the environmental and social impact risks that we have to do and make sure we design it in to the project to make sure it wor works. Um, so it, it, it's a key part. It's become even great. We, as a mining industry, we've always done it. Uh, I mean, it's nothing new to the mining industry, it, but I think what it is, is we have to talk about it more as an industry and explain what we do and why we do it. 
um, and get people to appreciate it. It sounds as though, to be perfectly frank, that you get great joy from doing it. Oh, I get incredible joy. I mean, I was in Zambia last week, you know, and, you know, I went to one of the schools where we were doing this and there were 110 people turned up. And and this is the second set of lessons. And they range from 16 to 60. I mean, clearly the 60 year old lady is not going to be looking for a job at Matanga, but she's taking the benefit of being getting an education, even at that age. And, you know, when you go to a, a village and you watch young girls digging a hole in a river to get water to feed themselves. And as soon as they walk away, all the animals rush to the water. So, you know, next time she goes for water, it's had animals in it as well. You like putting in a water borehole when we're out drilling is it's a no brainer. I mean, you, you walk away from it, you think, I'm adding value, not only for all. I mean, the principle of ESG I'm not, is. I'm not, a ma- I'm not a bad miner. I'm actually a good person. <laughs> well, and we're, we're there. State, it's all stakeholders are supposed to benefit through ESG, and they're all stakeholders. So they're all stakeholders. That's a, that's a lovely note to finish on. Uh, Daniel Major, CEO at GovX Uranium Inc., uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight.